And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome from Berlin. Coming up on the show, on display, Anselm Kiefer's monumental artworks are on show here in Germany. In season, it is time for the jasmine harvest in the south of France. In demand, why vegan food is finding more and more fans. But we begin today's show on a group of small islands in the North Atlantic between Scotland and Norway. The Faroe Islands are home to the fashion label Garoon Garoon. Its two owners have made a name for themselves using the untreated, locally sourced organic wool. There's a long tradition of working with this special yarn on these isolated islands, and this unique homely quality has now made the knitwear collection an international success. The Faroe Islands are home to 70,000 sheep and about 50,000 people. The capital is Torshaun, home to the Gurun Gurun Boutique. Designer Gurun Ludwig also uses the shop as a workshop. She loves to mix and match fabrics. Here she's combining Japanese paper yarn with Faroe wool. This knitted sweater is one of the label's best sellers and has been since the company started out 10 years ago. I took uh, some older sweaters from my father's, working sweaters, and uh, there was a lot of patterns, and I thought, oh, it's so blended. There's too many patterns in those sweaters, so I pick, pick out uh, the pattern which I like, found uh, interesting, and try to put them together and get the balance in the sweater. Gudrun Rogvadotter works on the upper floor, but she's often away, visiting trade fairs all over the world. After all, Torshan isn't exactly the nerve center of the fashion industry. Once in 2008, 100 experts and reporters were flown in especially to take a look at the Gudrun Gudrun collection, and were no doubt surprised to see how feminine and how figure-hugging it was. a crazy idea. Uh, I got the idea in the middle of the night. Uh, I just woke up and I thought, oh, I need to do a show on the hangar. And it was absolutely crazy. And it did cost so much money that uh, uh, we didn't have money for anything else for years after that. But it was a very good investment. It's not exactly easy to be a visionary on the Faroe Islands. The main industry is still fishing, and many local women opt to move away. The two Guruns were no exception. After leaving school, they both left the islands to study and work in Denmark. But when they returned home, they were shocked to see that Faroese wool, widely seen as some of the best in the world, was no longer being treated with respect. And in 2002, they designed their first collection around it. gets very very oily to protect themselves and that's really an advantage when you work with the wool it's really oily it's like you can you can almost like use it as hand cream or something it's like you get shiny hands when you do like this so it's really nice to have in your hands the smell is great it's like having a baby lamb in your hand or something so the materials is very very special once the wool has been spun a team of about 30 women hand knit the sweaters the oily character of the wool makes it water resistant and hard wearing. A whole day's work goes into one sweater and prices start at 250 euros. I, I like the lift and I, I have to have something in my hands and I, then it's obvious that I'm, I'm knitting for Guru and Guru. Back in Torshan. Thanks to Gurun Ludwig and Gurun Rogbodotir, Traditional Scandinavian knitwear has conquered catwalks in the world's fashion capitals. We're known really all over the world and, and a lot of fashion people, if you ask fashion people now in New York, in Tokyo, in, in Paris, a lot of people will know about us even though we are tiny, tiny. Um, so it was, it's, it's very important to do something different than the rest. It's a strategy that works. Here at New York Fashion Week, Gurung Gurung's creations from the Faroe Islands prove they have international appeal. 
They look so warm and cosy too, perfect for our coming winter. Now, German artist Anselm Kiefer has lived and worked in France since 1983, but he is currently back on his native turf with an exhibition in Baden-Baden, southwest Germany. His work is described as both spiritual and mythological, and also extremely heavy. Each piece weighs around 400 kilos and had to be hoisted into the museum with special cranes. Kiefer's works fetch up to a million euros apiece and have seldom been shown in one large-scale exhibition. So, our reporter went to take a look. Anselm Kiefer's works are always monumental and enigmatic. Mysterious landscapes made of melted and re-solidified lead. The artist's symbols are always unmistakably his own. He found his own pictorial language early in his career and has remained faithful to it. Ships as the playthings of destructive powers spouting rusty flames. The artist tests borders and looks beyond the surface. People need to have very clear borders. We can't exist without restricting ourselves. Our skin is our border. But if we limit ourselves too much, we get stiff and can't think properly. Artists maybe test their limits more than other people do. Anselm Kiefer's star pictures deal with the relationship between the Earth and the cosmos. The underlying idea is that each living being on Earth corresponds to a star in the heavens. Nature, religion, and mythology are Anselm Kiefer's central themes. Baden-Baden's Borda Museum is showing 33 pictures that span three decades. The Fertile Crescent is making its German debut. Its theme is the Tower of Babel that collapsed when its builders started speaking in tongues. The artist is particularly fascinated by the region between the Tigris and Euphrates. The written word was invented there, the cradle of civilization, ravaged by war and destruction to this day. For me, it's then for me, the Fertile Crescent is the best example of how something can be continuously destroyed and then rebuilt. The end is never the end. The end is always a beginning. An airplane made of lead so heavy that it could never fly, combined with seeds from a sunflower from which new life could sprout. Anselm Kiefer is drawn to paradoxes. His newest piece, part of the 2011 exhibition, calls the idea of a romantic mountain world into question. What would happen if the Alps were removed? Would we have a clear view to the Mediterranean? Anselm Kiefer still has many riddles in store. I have lots of pictures from the 70s packed away in containers that I'll finish up eventually. Those works will surely give viewers food for thought one day, like the exhibit in Baden-Baden. A bottle of Chanel No. 5 is sold every 30 seconds. This makes it the most successful and most famous perfume in the world, even though it's been around now for about 90 years. Using very clever marketing, Chanel has kept this image of the perfume attractive to all ages. But of course, nobody would buy it if they didn't actually like the scent. One essential ingredient is a particular type of jasmine, which is hand-picked in the fields around the town of Grasse in southern France. It's harvest time in the jasmine fields around Grasse in southern France. The entire crop, some 20 tons, is used to produce Chanel No. 5. Joseph Moule is continuing a tradition his great-grandfather started, cultivating the jasmine on his three hectares of land. The family has had an exclusive contract with Chanel since 1987. Vu le prix 
Jasmine from grass costs 20 to 30 times more than jasmine from other countries. But Chanel didn't want to replace the scent of jasmine from France with jasmine from foreign countries because that would have changed the character of its perfume. That was, of course, a stroke of luck for us. No other perfume contains as much jasmine. In 1921, Coco Chanel brought her first fragrance onto the market created by Ernest Beau. But it wasn't only the perfume that attracted attention, it was also the bottle and the name. Number five supposedly stands for the fifth test version, and it was also said to be Coco Chanel's lucky number. From the very start, advertising was crucial. In 1937, Coco Chanel had her picture taken at the Ritz Hotel in Paris to publicize the fragrance. Catherine Deneuve and Carole Bouquet later became the faces of Chanel. Asked what she wore in bed, Marilyn Monroe once said, two drops of Chanel No. 5. Andy Warhol presented the perfume bottle as an art object. Nowadays, elaborate PR campaigns with French actress Audrey Totou make sure the 90-year-old fragrance stays in fashion. And even though he has nothing to do with the Chanel fragrance, Karl Lagerfeld's catwalk show for the Fashion House in July 2009 took place against a backdrop of oversized bottles. The image is very important. Who wants to be associated with something old or out of date? In terms of fashion and beauty, the house of Chanel has a very young, modern, and extremely feminine image. But there's a lot of hard work involved. The jasmine blossoms have to be hand-picked between 7 a.m. and 1 p.m. six days a week from August until early October. The 60 workers are paid according to the weight of the flowers they pick. They harvest up to three kilos a day, about 24,000 blossoms. The flowers are then processed into a highly concentrated extract called an absolute. More than five million blossoms are needed to produce one kilogram of absolute, and a kilo is worth 40,000 euros. At the end of the process, every bottle is then sealed by hand, so the jasmine from Grasse keeps its scent for as long as possible. Vegans are people who choose not to use any animal-based products. There are currently over 600,000 vegans in Germany, more than in most other European countries. And when you consider the fact that meat dishes have a prominent place in German cuisine, the statistic is quite a surprising one. But it seems that a lot of people these days want to reduce their meat intake, and more and more vegan restaurants and supermarkets are opening all over the country. Many of them are here in the capital, so we went to have a scout around. Around. Lunchtime in Berlin. Many restaurant menus now feature not only vegetarian dishes, but also vegan meals. There are now seven vegan restaurants in the German capital. Kops is a new restaurant in Berlin's Mitte district. It offers dishes like risotto, goulash with dumplings, and fricassee, all made of purely vegetarian ingredients. Head chef Björn Muschinski has been a vegan for 16 years. He came up with a simple concept, good, solid German vegan food. I grew up with this cuisine, so I know it well. Until I was 14, I ate a lot of meat. The aroma of roasted meat has stayed with me, and I know the flavor. It's the same for many people. When they consider going to a vegan restaurant, they look for the hearty, savory food they remember from childhood. That's what we serve. Some 9,000 vegans live in Berlin. Some of them shop here. Vegans opened some four months ago. It's Europe's first fully vegan supermarket. It's owned by Jan Bredak. The former automotive executive has been vegan for more than two years. We want our customers to know that everything they buy here is made without animal products or ingredients. In addition, almost everything is organic and fair trade. That was another hurdle. The store offers baked goods made in-house, sausages, cheese, and milk made of soya and other plant-based ingredients, as well as ready-made meals. 
You can also buy cosmetics and dog food. The shop also aims to attract health-conscious people who are not vegans and the curious. Some 500 customers shop here every day. Berlin is special because there are a lot of people here from different countries, and we have many more tourists here than other German cities, from countries where veganism has already been established. We also have a lot of people who already live ecologically and have a different awareness. They help spawn the organic supermarket scene here. The Cops restaurant. It's 7 p.m. on opening night. On the menu is pumpkin and beetroot soup. Björn Mashinsky wants to attract a wide range of diners. I'd like to reach people who say a vegan diet is not for them, or they don't know what it is, or it doesn't taste good. Those are prejudices that are wrong. Here we can prove that easily. Around 100 people attended the opening. Many of them committed carnivores. Well seasoned, tasted good. I like the food. I'd eat here again. At some point, I'll feel like having a schnitzel, but it's good. Vegan cuisine, a culinary delight. In Berlin, that's no longer a contradiction in terms. Our next report takes us to Riga, the capital of Latvia. Located on the Baltic coast, this thriving metropolis is home to some 720,000 people, or almost a third of the whole country's population. The centre of the city has been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and we met up with a local expert who showed us some of the architectural highlights that this city has to offer. Riga's city centre is home to architecture from a number of different eras. Residents say their city is like an open-air museum. Janis Drieper worked as an urban planner here for many years. He admires the city's architectural diversity. Different parts of the city, it's like our history. Uh, you know, if you are living in a crossroads, so you have so different times. We had a German time, Russian time, Latvian time, Russian time ago, Swedish time, Polish time. So uh, all these times somehow overlapping and left some traces. Riga was founded in 1201 by a German bishop from the city of Bremen. In tribute to its founder, there's a sculpture of the Bremen town musicians outside the medieval St. Peter's church. Riga has also been heavily influenced by Russian culture. In 1990, when Latvia ceased to be a Soviet republic, the city's old town was painstakingly restored. Nowadays, it enjoys UNESCO World Heritage status. It's particularly famous for its Art Nouveau architecture. No other city in the world can boast such a complete ensemble of Art Nouveau buildings. At the very end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, Riga was the main seaport for Soviet Russia. Uh, it was a vibrant cultural place. Uh, it was a center of the fashion of this time, and why Art Nouveau came to Riga. And now we have more than 800 buildings from this period. The facades of the buildings are richly embellished, giving this area of Riga a sophisticated metropolitan feel. The city's Art Nouveau Museum shows how the movement had a wide influence that encompassed much more than just architecture. It grew out of avant-garde, a cultural phenomenon and a way of life for artists in the early 20th century who were looking for an alternative to the mainstream. Furniture and window adornments in this style are still popular today. A totally new district is under construction here on the left bank complete with state-of-the-art buildings, such as the new National Library. If everything is totally changed, that you have, you've got lost in a city. So we would like to have some kind of good balance between two of these things. The traditional way of living, life kind, 
and the new part. And it gives some contrast, it gives some flavor to our life, to the city space. The project was put on hold for a long time because of the financial crisis. When it's completed, the futuristic landscape will be an interesting contrast to the city's historical old town. Now, when you hear the word recycling, old plastic bottles and newspapers probably come to mind. But what would you think of if you heard the word upcycling? Well, this is a term that has been coined by a social project called Gabarage. Based in the Austrian capital, Vienna, the company creates high-quality, eye-catching products that give old articles a new lease of life. Gabarage's latest product has been inspired by the movies and their designs give a nostalgic Hollywood touch to a local hotel. These armchairs are made of 70-year-old suitcases. Somehow this whole room is reminiscent of one of the best-known film classics of all time. Casablanca. The decor of this hotel room was inspired by the classic U.S. romantic drama, which was made in 1942. The furniture evokes the famous love story immortalized by Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman. The furniture was designed by Michael Hensel together with the Gabarage company. For example, this cupboard made from the wood of an old piano. All of his designs are inspired by old movies. I watch the movie with the client and we brainstorm about what we can use from the film, what materials, whether we can get the quantity we need, and also if the quality will be good enough to use it as furniture. Gamaraj has been working on the hotel project for about two years. The hotel's 13 rooms will each be unique inspired by a range of movies from an action film to a science fiction flick and a thriller. This is the Forrest Gump room. The ping pong table plays a major role because he played a lot of table tennis. So we made the beds and closets out of several ping pong tables. Another feature of the room is a reference to the scene in which Forrest Gump sits on his packed suitcase at a bus stop. The Gabarage workshop is in Vienna. The designers use material that's been donated to the company or comes from fleet markets. The company's agenda isn't only creative. A lot of the people here are former addicts. The job helps them prepare for a return to normal life. Gabarage has been upcycling for nine years, but has ventured into unknown territory with the hotel project. It can take months to complete a single hotel room. What makes it unusual is that everything we make for the hotel are prototypes. Everything we make is being made for the first time. That's quite a challenge for both the designers and the craftspeople. The company's showroom is in central Vienna. Individual pieces can be bought here. Depending on the complexity of the design, a single item can cost up to 500 euros. The works on display include sofas from garbage cans and truck tarpaulins, as well as vases made out of bowling pins. The company believes in sustainability and social responsibility. Sylvia Bayer runs the showroom and is confident that the hotel project will help raise the company's profile. I hope that working on such a major project will help us reach new customers. It'll also help spread the word that recycling can be beautiful. Back at the hotel. This room, which has yet to be completed, is a tribute to The Godfather. So far, the public response has been very positive. The guests are often surprised. To begin with, they don't really know what to expect. But when they come in the room, they're always positively surprised. They start looking around and discovering all the tiny details. 
Soon the guests in this room will be able to feel like Don Corleone. All 13 theme rooms in the hotel are set to be ready by spring 2012. What a perfect place for film buffs. And that brings us to the end of another edition of Euromax Highlights. Just a quick reminder before we go that you can see all of those reports and lots more on our website. Just go to dw-world.de slash English slash Euromax dash highlights. I hope you enjoyed the show and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.